Hi, my name is uh, Dr. Corwin Warmink. I'm a pediatric emergency room doctor. Getting ready to talk to you guys about anesthetics. What are they? Well, let's look at the word. Anesthesia, and from the Greek, you know this, obviously. Uh, it's uh, without, seizure is sensation, so basically without sensation. Um, they're medications that cause your body to lose their normal uh, reflexes to you lose pain, lose consciousness. Basically, it's what puts you to sleep. Hopefully, this lecture will not be uh, included amongst that. All right, so uh, what is the goal of anesthesia? Um, basically, you want to have analgesia, so loss of pain. You want amnesia, loss of memory. You want uh, muscle relaxation, that always helps the surgeons out, and loss of protective reflexes, things like coughing, hiccuping, things like that and you want the patient to be unconscious. If they're awake, that's not good for anybody. There's no single drug that can do all these safely and rapidly. So whenever you're doing anesthesia, you're gonna be using multiple agents. And we're gonna talk about pretty much all of them. In anesthesia, there's kind of different forms of uh, agents. There's pre-anesthetic agents, things you give to help relax and uh, kind of fight against the side effects of the anesthesia. There's inhaled anesthetics and there's IV anesthetics. We're also gonna talk about local anesthetics uh, just for smaller local procedures. Um, we'll talk about kind of how the anesthetics work, what the right choices for your anesthetics are, and ones to avoid. Often uh, in testing, they're gonna ask you kind of not, hey, what's the best choice, but usually what's the wrong choice? It's a lot easier to ask that, and so pay a lot of attention uh, to side effects and which ones are contraindicated. There's two main factors used in selecting anesthesia. The procedure that you're gonna perform and basically the person you're performing it on. So patient factors. Um, obviously you're gonna want a different anesthetic agent for an appendectomy versus you know, cutting off someone's toenail versus taking someone to an MRI. Each one has different factors um, procedure based and you're gonna have a lot of different factors based on who your patient is. Is it a pregnant? 30 year old, is it an 80 year old with a bad heart, or is it a you know, 10 year old kid? So the status of your patient's organ systems is gonna be important in what you choose also. Obviously, uh, the respiratory system, say. If someone has asthma, that's gonna make it hard for you to control your inhaled anesthetics. You're gonna have to choose agents by that. Cardiac, obviously, if someone has a heart history, there's medications that are preferred based on their uh, safety profile uh, with the heart. Liver kidneys. Also, we'll talk, especially with the inhaled anesthetics, um, some that are contraindicated there. Other things that can uh, affect your, your patient status would be medications that they're on, whether it's uh, self-induced. Alcoholics, obviously, are going to kind of have a ramped up liver, so they're going to need more barbiturates, say. Um, if you have a, someone that's a, a, a drug user, opiate user, they're going to require much more morphine and, and opiates. Um, there's plenty of, you know, prescribed medications that also can affect what you're gonna um, use as an anesthetic agent. All right, so let's talk about the drugs themselves. There's two things that you have to have as a drug to be able to be an uh, anesthetic. Um, they have to cross the blood-brain barrier. To do that, they have to be lipid-soluble and have a very small molecular weight. Makes sense, drug has to get to the brain to kind of shut your brain down. All right, so let's talk about anesthesia itself, the stages that are involved. First, you have what's called induction. That's starting to give the patient the medication and getting them to a surgical anesthetic state. And there's maintenance, where you're basically sustaining the anesthesia while the procedure, surgery, whatever can be performed, and then recovery. From discontinuation of the medicine to resumption of normal sensation and bodily function and reflexes. Let's talk about depth of anesthesia. Um, the, the depths of anesthesia are broken into four stages. Uh, it was based on how ether worked. Um, nowadays, these aren't as uh, obvious because we induce people in anesthesia very rapidly. Um, you'll see that that's a good thing. Um, ether was very slow, but you gotta learn them because they like to test about them. Stage one, analgesia. So basically, you're getting decreased pain, but the patient is still conversant and conscious, so they're, they're feeling pretty good, but they're still awake. Um, 
right about the end of that, you can get some amnesia going also. Stage two is a stage you don't want to be in very long. It's called excitement. Basically, they'll get kind of delirious. They'll get combative even. The blood pressure will go up. Respiratory rate will go up. Often they can vomit. You can see that's not a very fun stage for anyone. Stage three, surgical anesthesia. It's where you want to be. The patient is down, kind of in the anesthesia parlance. Um, they have regular respiration. They're not responding to the surgery. Um, more and more you'll get decreased reflexes uh, until finally, basically, the pupils just become fixed. Um, often they're going to be monitored, one, to their response to the surgery. Nowadays they will kind of check EEG readings and kind of the brain response. Beyond that, stage four, medullary paralysis. That doesn't sound good, does it? Um, basically you're in very deep uh, anesthesia uh, to the point where there's you know, no reflexes, um, very decreased respiration, blood pressure, uh, and eventually if you don't stop it, uh, it can lead to death. So when we talk about in induction, uh, that's bringing uh, a patient up to surgical anesthesia. Kind of the one thing you want to realize is the quicker you can do it, the better. Uh, you know, the patients go under faster and you can avoid that uh, excitement phase where they can get combative. Um, so kind of throughout the history of making anesthetics, uh, things that have a quick induction time have been uh, um, well received. Um, the classic uh, ether got replaced by halothane uh, in the 50s uh, just for that very reason you can you know uh, induce people so much faster with this that's why people like the inhaled anesthetics because they're quick and um, we'll talk about them at length more the fact that ether also could cause your whole operating room to explode um, factored in there also so classically for in induction the most common used uh, IV drug is thiopental. It's a, it's a um, barbiturate. Um, that's the one that you'll, you'll learn a lot about, but frankly propofol, uh, an IV agent that uh, is fairly new, is really kind of taking over induction. Um, and kids often, uh, they'll be induced just with inhaled anesthetics just because obviously in a, a small child getting an IV itself is stressful, so if you can have them just breathe uh, the anesthetic, get induced, then you can put an IV later. A nice thing about the um, inhaled anesthetics is in general they do plump your veins up also, so that's why anesthesiologists always look like they're great at starting IVs. So maintenance is basically sustaining the anesthesia through the surgical procedure. Most important thing is keeping your patient properly uh, down during the surgery. Uh, you don't want them moving, hiccuping, feeling pain, obviously. Um, best way to do this is to monitor their vital signs, blood pressure, heart rate, respiratory rate. Nowadays they have a lot of um, EEG monitoring that also uh, keeps them maintained during the surgery. Um, the next step is recovery. Um, obviously that's turning the uh, anesthesia off and letting them wake up. You know, anesthesiologists actually do a really good job of that fine line between keeping them down but not having them out for so long. And really speed uh, is of the essence. One, just it helps turn OR rooms and keeps things moving, but two, if something does go wrong, you want to be able to bring those patients back to consciousness rapidly. Now I want to talk to you guys about inhalation anesthetics, all right, basically the mask. The uh, inhalation anesthetics are the mainstay of anesthesia. They kind of are what started it all. You had uh, ether and chloroform back in the 1800s. Uh, nitrous oxide was even discovered in the 1700s. Um, and wasn't used a ton for anesthesia, but these things have been around for some time. Things have changed dramatically in the last 20, 30 years and how they're used, um, but pretty much if you're gonna have surgery, you're gonna get an inhaled anesthetic. The main way in which inhaled anesthetics are used is after induction, usually with an IV medication, uh, you'll use an inhaled anesthetic to maintain uh, the anesthesia. They're well liked for this because they can be turned off and on very rapidly. And you can adjust their dosing real easily just by changing the concentration in the inhaled mixture. So pretty much if you're going under surgery, you may be induced with IV, but you're gonna get inhaled just to kind of maintain you through uh, the course. And they work great for this. So the modern inhaled anesthetics are in general all volatile halogenated hydrocarbons. Um, those end in A-N-E-S, halothane being kind of the, the standard bearer for them. Um, 
nitrous oxide also is used. It's kind of in its own category. Um, but predominantly, you're going to be using the halogenated hydrocarbons. Let's talk about potency of inhaled uh, anesthetics. It's stated as the MAC, the MAC, or the mean alveolar concentration. Uh, the best way to think about it is this is the amount of drug in the alveoli that is required for 50% of the population to be under anesthesia. You may have heard of an ED50 or effective dose 50. Um, it's written ED with a subscript 50. Um, it's the same idea that the MAC is just the um, inhaled anesthetic version. There also is the LD50, the lethal dose for 50%. That's something that you don't want to deal with, obviously. The MAC is expressed as a percent of gas required in the alveoli, in, in the mixture, to reach the 50% uh, anesthesia. For halothane, it's very small. For nitrous oxide, um, it's, it's big. And so when I say small, I mean the concentration. You do not need much halothane. So halothane is the MAC daddy of inhaled anesthetics. Nitrous takes much more. Um, the potency of inhaled anesthetics can kind of be um, determined by how lipid soluble they are. So halothane, very lipid soluble, nitrous oxide is not. It kind of helps me just to think of nitrous oxide as something that's very inert. I mean, it's just two nitrogen atoms and an oxygen atom, and so it doesn't uh, bind to things very easily. Halothane and the other uh, anes, much more so. So in summary, the more lipid soluble the drug, the more potent the drug will be. And this is something that we're going to go back to also about um, blood solubility, um, but it works a little bit differently. Let's talk about uptake and distribution. So how are these inhaled anesthetics taken into the body and how are they distributed throughout the body? The partial pressure of the gas at the origin of the respiratory pathway is a force that basically drives the medicine into the alveoli, then into the blood, and then to the brain, and eventually into the other body tissues. That steady state is achieved in the body when the pressure basically in the body equals the ins inspired pressure of the mix that you're bagging into the patient. So how do you determine that steady state or how do you reach that steady state? Um, let me tell you. First is alveolar wash-in. So basically, you have normal air in your lungs. You're replacing that with the air with the inhaled anesthetic. Um, it's kind of determined by respiratory rate and concentration of the drug. So it's basically how fast and how much is getting bagged into the patient. Next is anesthesia uptake. So you've gotten it into the lungs. Now you've got to take it into your body. So basically, that can be determined by the solubility in the blood, how soluble the the drug actually is when it hits the you know alveolar blood barrier, the cardiac output, how much blood's going around, and the gradient between the air and the blood. So at some point you can tell that you know the blood level of the drug is increasing to match that in the air. So we talked about lipid solubility, now we're going to talk a little bit about blood solubility. It's the same deal. Halothane is very soluble in blood. Um, nitrous oxide, not very soluble. Like I talked about, nitrous oxide is kind of inert. But uh, the solubility in the blood doesn't mean that it's going to get to your brain faster or work faster. In fact, it's the exact opposite. Nitrous oxide, much faster on and off as far as achieving anesthetic levels in the brain. Halothane, the slowest. So basically just think it's all trapped in the blood. It's not really getting where you need to go. So cardiac output, obviously um, heart rate and your stroke volume. Uh, the more blood you have flowing around, the easier it is for that blood to get to the brain. It's kind of a no-brainer. Then the other thing that will affect it is the pressure gradient between the alveoli and the venous return. And so as the um, amount of drug in the, the blood is increased, it's harder for the blood from the alveoli to get into the blood. All right, let's talk about the effect of different tissues on anesthesia uptake. Um, basically, the differences are going to be on how they're perfused and how much they can store. If you think about the brain, the heart, the liver, the kidneys, those are very highly perfused organs. Um, they're going to um, have a rapid uptake and actually a rapid um, discharge of the medication but they're going to reach that steady state quickly. So, you, I mean, the brain is where it acts. Luckily, that will happen quickly. If you think about skeletal muscle, um, 
it's a very large amount of your body. Um, during surgery, it's actually not perfused very much. I mean, that makes sense. You're not doing a whole lot. You're just laying there. Um, and so it takes a, a while to get to steady state, but it also is a very large area that can kind of hold um, medication. Fat uh, can have a huge effect. Obviously, we talked about the, what are the two things that you need to cross the blood-brain barrier? Lipid-soluble, low molecular weight. So these are lipid-soluble drugs, obviously attracted to fat. They can uh, be stored there for a considerable amount of time also. And so the fatter your patient is, the more drug that's going to be in their system for a longer time. It uh, definitely will prolong how long it takes your patient to get to steady state also. And so let's talk about washout. Obviously, you know, the same factors kind of involved in getting the drug into your system are involved when getting it out of your system. Nitrous oxide is very fast getting it in. It's also fast getting it out. Halophane, slow in, slow out. Basically, the same factors are involved with fat and your skeletal muscle can determine kind of how long washout takes. All right. Let's talk briefly about the mechanism of inhaled anesthetics. You know, there's, there's no one single receptor um, that's been, been found. It's, these are all kind of even theoretical at times uh, explanations. Um, part of the things that point toward there not just being one receptor is they're, they're very different chemically unrelated drugs that can all end up with the same effect. So that points against there being a single one. In general, they're either, either gonna have an increased inhibitory um, function or decrease excitation at the brain uh, nerve endings. Um, GABA is always usually a player. Um, chloride channels, um, you know, it's not uh, very well known how some of these drugs work at all, actually. We do know that the halogenated hydrocarbons uh, work at the chloride receptor, so when in doubt, chloride's a great answer. GABA is not a bad one either. Okay, let's talk about some of the specific inhaled agents. Halothane is kind of the standard bearer for this. Uh, it uh, came into use in the 1950s, and it really did change uh, practice dramatically. Um, kind of mentioned ether and chloroform before. They really were not very good inhaled anesthetics at all. Halothane came in incredibly uh, useful uh, because it was such a faster time to onset to induce uh, anesthesia, and it was safe. It's, it's not flammable. So those two things made it very popular very rapidly. Nowadays it really is not used that much. We've developed much better um, agents, but halothane is kind of the one that gets the most press time, I guess, because it was the first. Halothane is a very potent anesthetic, but a weak uh, analgesic agent. So if you're using halothane, you're almost always going to have fentanyl or some other opioid used with it. Um, some other characteristics, it, it's good in OB procedures because it relaxes the uterus. Uh, it's also uh, used in kids um, because it actually has a, a sweet smell to it. It's hard to describe um, and it's not irritating to the airway so kids uh, breathe it in without problem. The reason it's not really used that much anymore is because a large portion of it is metabolized. So 20 30% of it even may be metabolized into things that can uh, affect other organ systems. The newer agents, as we'll talk about, some of them are hardly metabolized at all. Um, the side effects of it that can cause the problems of the metabolites are um, hepatic necrosis. It's rare, one in 10,000, but it, it can be lethal. It also can cause malignant hyperthermia um, in people that have like uh, myasthenia gravis, uh, muscular dystrophy, burn victims, anything that's muscle uh, um, related, um, you can uh, get malignant hyperthermia. Basically, uh, a very serious complication. It's very rare, but they love to ask this question. Malignant hyperthermia, probably you get a hundred questions asked for it for every one patient that anyone has ever seen. Just an aside, it's not really related to halothane, but the treatment of malignant hyper Thermia is dantrolene. Like that will be on a test at some point in your life, guaranteed. The other uh, kind of bad side effect of halothane is its cardiac effect. It can cause arrhythmias and a lot of hypotension. For me, the way I like to remember it is just to really think of H's. Halothane can cause hepatitis, hyperthermia, um, hypotension, you can throw in there too. But the biggies are that uh, hepatic necrosis and the malignant hyperthermia. All right, let's move on to an agent called Enflurane. It's less potent 
than uh, halothane, but has a much faster onset of induction. You can kind of remember us talking about lipid solubility and blood solubility, so it's less soluble in the blood, but then can be turned on and off faster. Um, nice thing about Enflurane, only about 2.5% of it is metabolized, so the side effects are less, but there definitely are side effects that you need to know about. The uh, good thing about it, too, is that it has uh, much fewer arrhythmia complications and very little cardiac effects, so it's good in uh, heart patients. Um, the negative is what is metabolized goes to the kidneys, so if a patient has kidney disease, no Enflurane. The other uh, negative is it causes CNS excitation, um, basically can cause you to seize. So if you have a seizure disorder, you're not getting enflurane. Like I stated before, the, for these, really the best way to delineate them is to go by their side effects because that's often what's going to be asked is, you know, a 50-year-old cardiac patient, you just will know how things not good. Oh, enflurane is probably a good idea. All right, let's move on to isoflurane. Um, it is used quite often now. It's a, it's very popular because it has almost no metabolism. Like it, it pretty much just is in and out of your system. It has very little tissue toxicity. It has no cardiac arrhythmia effects. So obviously very popular in cardiac patients. Um, the other thing that it does is it actually increases coronary blood flow. Um, and so in someone that has ischemic heart disease, it's good because it kind of pumps up their heart. You know, the same effect on the coronary blood flow causes vasodilatation elsewhere and can cause some hypotension. So that's something to be aware of. But in general, isoflurane is a very popular drug uh, used quite often. Now let's talk about desflurane. Um, this is extremely rapid drug. It uh, is great for outpatient surgery because you can really induce uh, um, anesthesia very quickly. One of the downsides is it requires a special vaporizer, um, which is expensive, but it, it, it's used a lot in um, just quick procedures. Um, it can cause uh, airway irritation and some uh, cough and secretions, and so you really can't use it in extended anesthesia, but that's kind of the one um, downside is it can irritate the airway. The next agent I would talk, like to talk about is sevoflurane. It is uh, good for kids because it's not pungent at all. Some of the other agents actually have an odor to them and it doesn't irritate the airway at all like desflurane does. The negative to it is it's nephrotoxic. So again, uh, not good for kidney patients, but in general, that's, you know, now of the newer agents used prominently in kids. Next, I'd like to talk about one of my personal favorites, nitrous oxide. So it's N2O, not to be confused with NO, nitric oxide, um, important molecule in smooth muscle and in the lungs. Um, this is an aside, but nitric oxide won molecule of the year in 1992. You probably didn't know there was a molecule of the year, but there you go. Um, so nitrous oxide, we're back. This is a, a very old uh, drug, 1780s. Joseph Priestley actually discovered it um, and even kind of said, hey, I think this does have some anesthetic effects. Uh, no one ever used it medicinally uh, for some time, but in the late uh, uh, 1700s into the early 1800s, uh, it was used at parties, even uh, usually in Britain by the upper class. So they knew how to have a good time. Um, the first kind of anesthesia um, recorded use was in the 1840s um, for dental procedures. Um, it had a big setback because uh, there was a guy going around doing a lot of these procedures and uh, showing how well it worked and he had a big one uh, in Boston and it did not work. The patient totally flipped out and uh, that set lowly nitrous oxide back years. So uh, nitrous oxide is a very potent analgesic. It's very good at taking away pain, but it's a very weak anesthetic. So it is good in procedures where you don't really need the patient out, but they're undergoing something painful. Dental extraction is a, a perfect example of that. So um, that's why it's often used in dentistry. It's also very safe. It's very difficult to overdose uh, someone on nitrous oxide as long as you keep about a 30% mix of oxygen uh, there. And so the way I think of it is it's so safe, even a dentist can use it. All right, so um, the nice thing about it too is it has very little uh, toxic effects. It doesn't affect your heart, liver, kidneys. Um, it's, it's a very safe drug. Um, 
when combined with other anesthetics, inhaled anesthetics, it, it can produce something called the second gas effect. The, the nitrous is uh, taken, absorbed so quickly that you actually get your other anesthetics into the body more rapidly also. It's a, anesthesiologists love the second gas effect, so it may be on your, your test, but just know that nitrous oxide causes the second gas effect. Um, it concentrates the other anesthetic agents in the alveoli because it's taken up so quick. Nitrous oxide is moving in and out of your body very rapidly. That also can cause some of the side effects of it. And so because it's uh, replacing uh, the nitrogen in your system so rapidly before it can even diffuse out, it can cause a pneumothorax or a lot of sinus pressure. Air to build up in your sinuses can be very uncomfortable. So just whenever there's the side effect of pneumothorax, the answer is nitrous oxide. Um, but in general, it's a, it's a great agent. Um, this isn't in your chapter, but if you want to look really smart sometime on rounds or around an anesthesiologist, uh, kind of the next step of inhaled anesthetics is xenon. Um, it's very inert, uh, works very quickly. The problem is it's, it's expensive. They're using it some in Europe and in Japan. Um, the nice thing about it is the, one of the, the bad things about nitrous oxide is it actually is a, a greenhouse gas, and so um, xenon doesn't go into the atmosphere and cause any problems. So in the future, xenon may be the the way. Now let's pause for a moment and review the material that was just covered. Before we do that, if you haven't already done so, this might be a good time to read your pharmacology text that corresponds to the material that was just discussed. Then together we'll go through the quick review in the study guide. <laughs> let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Oh, hello there. I'm just cleaning for a dinner party I have tonight. Everything has to be nice and tidy, bright and shiny. You know what else should shine? You on your exams. When trying to recall the names of the inhaled anesthetics, just think shine. S-H-I-N-E. Sevoflurane, halothane, isoflurane, nitrous oxide, and enflurane. Shine! <laughs> let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. But don't actually sing during your exam. <laughs> they frown upon it. Trust me. Hi, I'm Dr. Chris Lewis, one of the chief educators here at Doctors in Training. It's time for your quick review number one. Let's get started. Match the following stages of depth of anesthesia with its characteristics. So remember we had our four stages of anesthesia. What happens in each one? Well, for stage one, uh, we have decreased pain, but the patient is conscious and conversational. Stage two, uh, this is not a good place to be in. Increase in blood pressure, combative, delirious. Sometimes patients will also vomit in this stage, so not a happy place to be. Don't want to spend much time in stage two. Stage three, regular respirations, decreased reflexes. A pretty good state to be in for most uh, procedures, and in stage four, is decreased respirations, no reflexes. If you're in stage four, you better hope you have them intubated and in, uh, you're controlling their ABCs at that point. Next question. Drugs with what characteristic will lead to rapid induction and recovery time? So we've talked about some drugs uh, that will initiate your anesthesia very quickly and then leave the body uh, very quickly. And then obviously we have medicines that do the opposite. So what did we talk about? We talked about the uh, solubility in blood. So drugs with decreased solubility in the blood uh, will have this rapid induction in recovery time. And what was an example of, of that? That was your nitrous oxide, remember? So nitrous oxide, if you can imagine it, it's not really mingling in the blood, it's just sort of floating around and then it can very quickly get into the brain, quickly get into the tissues. An example of a medicine that's very blood soluble uh, was halothane. So halothane, it gets stuck in the blood. It can't get to the brain. It can't get to, the, get to those t tissues. Therefore, you have the slower induction, the slower recovery time because it's mingling too much in the blood. Next question. Will drugs with increased solubility in lipids lead to an increase or decrease in potency? So this is a pretty easy one. Um, the answer is an increase in potency. So a, a lipid-loving drug will get into the brain quicker. So that's how I like to remember it, that if, if it love, loves lipids, it loves the brain, therefore it's gonna get in quick, it's gonna get out quick. Conversely, if it's low lipid-soluble, then it doesn't like to get into the brain. 
Next question. What are some effects of inhaled anesthetics? So let's go through these. So we get uh, myocardial depression, you get respiratory depression, nausea, emesis, increased cerebral blood flow, and decreased cerebral metabolic demand. Next question. Rank the following inhaled anesthetics in terms of their solubility in blood, uh, starting with the most soluble to the least soluble. So this goes back to, you know, if it's more soluble in the blood, you're going to have a slower induction, and then conversely, uh, if it's not very soluble in the blood, then you'll have a rapid induction. So let's go through the list here. So we already talked about one of the most soluble, and that's halothane. And then let's go down the list, influrane, isoflurane, sevoflurane, desflurane, and then our least soluble nitrous oxide. Next question. Why is halothane usually combined with an opioid? Very important. You, you don't want to just give someone halothane for a uh, very good reason because halothane is a very potent anesthetic but a very weak analgesic. So they're going to feel the pain. Uh, they'll just be knocked out. So that opioid is there to help decrease the pain sensations. Next question. A patient was given halothane for a surgical procedure and develops malignant hyperthermia. How would you treat this? Always good to know this answer. The answer is dantrolene. So dantrolene can be used for malignant hyperthermia. What other um, situation will you find malignant hyperthermia? Well, it's called neuroleptic uh, malignant syndrome. So if someone is on an antipsychotic uh, medication, also known as a neuroleptic, you can get this uh, neuroleptic malignant syndrome, and you can use dantrolene in that situation as well. Next question. Match the following characteristics with the appropriate inhaled anesthetic. All right, so first we have a halothane. The halothane will be matched up with, can cause hepatic necrosis, malignant hyperthermia, arrhythmias, and hypotension. Influrane. So influrane we have cannot be used in patients with kidney disease uh, or seizure disorders. Isoflurane. That's going to go uh, along with uh, no cardiac arrhythmia effects, useful for patients with ischemic uh, heart disease, can cause hypotension. Desflurane. Desflurane causes airway irritation, requires special vaporizer. Remember, it's expensive but pretty nice. Sevoflurane, no airway irritation, low pungency, nephrotoxic. And nitrous oxide uh, may produce a second gas effect, can cause uh, pneumothorax. All right, so that's going to conclude our quick review number one. Let's get back to the lecture. Okay, let's move on to intravenous anesthetics. So what they're usually used for is rapid induction. So with IV, I mean, you can in seconds have someone induced, and then they're usually maintained with inhaled anesthetics after that. Um, let's go over some of the most common ones used. Barbiturates, uh, the most common would be thiopental. It's very rapid. 45 seconds and your patient can be under. It, it was classically the most common used IV agent. Now it's being replaced a lot by propofol. So thiopental is a very potent uh, anesthetic but a weak analgesic. You're gonna have to use some pain medicine along with it. It's ultra short acting. I mean, you can turn it off and literally seconds later they're, they're up and at them. So um, it has a very high lipid solubility. It's very potent also. Um, don't think about the IV um, potencies the same as the um, inhaled. They're, they're different. But this drug is off and on quick. Just some things to know about it, though, that uh, are negatives. Um, you have to use an analgesic agent. Otherwise, you'll get increased blood pressure and other effects. It can cause hypotension, cough. Um, it irritates airways and can even cause apnea. So no thiopental and asthma. That's important. That is something that they definitely will ask you. Thiopental and asthma do not mix. Third time, no thiopental and asthma. Anyway, okay. Um, the other thing is, uh, this is a rare condition, porphyria, but thiopental basically exacerbates porphyria. So it's not something you see very commonly, but it's something that you should know. Let's move on to the benzodiazepines. Uh, for example, midazolam, diazepam, lorazepam. These are sedatives, basically make you drowsy. You may hear the term like sedative hypnotic, and it's not kind of what is, how those differentiate. A sedative basically gets you drowsy and relaxed. A hypnotic basically puts you to sleep. So the nice thing about the uh, the benzos is they give you good amnestic effects. So 
patients don't remember thing. If you're wanting to put a tube somewhere in someone's body that they may not want there, benzodiazepines are great. Um, so endoscopy, colonoscopy, um, roofies. Uh, anyway, um, benzodiazepines really can't be used as a sole agent. They're often going to be used with other agents uh, such as ketamine or other IV agents. Um, they can cause uh, post-op respiratory depression and uh, hypotension. If you do overdose uh, someone on benzos, the uh, reversal agent is called flumazenil. Uh, and that's something they like to ask a lot also. All these drugs, it's good. You got to know their reversal agents. Um, they definitely will ask you those questions uh, often. Next, let's talk about the opioids. Classically, morphine uh, is kind of the, the hallmark of them. Fentanyl is used often because it's more rapid and more potent. So obviously, opioids are very good uh, at analgesia. Um, they do give a little bit of amnesia also. Um, the side effects of them are can be severe hypotension, respiratory depression. You can get something called chest wall rigidity. Basically, the patient you can't bag them. That's scary for everyone. And vomiting. You probably know the reversal agent for opioids, naloxone. It's very short acting. Just know sometimes on tests they'll like to ask you, one, do you know naloxone? But you'll, you have to repeat the dose. And really one of the best ways to tell uh, how opioids are using are, are pupils. Um, very pinpoint pupils in uh, opioid overdoses. If you give them a naloxone, those pupils are going to pop out big time. All right, moving on to automate. It's a hypnotic, so basically we talked about the sedative hy hypnotic. Uh, it will put you to sleep. It has no analgesia at all. So if you give someone just automate, um, you're going to have to give them an analgesic uh, along with it. Um, the beautiful thing about automate is it's very short acting and has a very rapid induction so you can get people down and it has no cardiac effects. So if you have someone that's hypotensive or having um, cardiac issues, Atomidate is good. The uh, side effect of Atomidate that you guys need to know is that it can suppress cortisol and aldosterone levels in your uh, system. All right, let's move on to ketamine. It's a PCP derived drug and it kind of acts similar to PCP. Um, it's what's called a dissociative anesthetic. The patient will actually be unconscious but appear like they're awake. It can do some interesting things to people. Um, it is very good at analgesia, so it's uh, often used with like a, a benzo uh, at times. Um, it uh, causes a lot of sedation and uh, immobility, like uh, people just can't move with it. Um, and it is amnestic also. Um, it actually kind of opposite to some of these other agents, increases your blood flow, increases your cardiac output, and actually increases airflow in your airways. And so it's something that we like to use a lot in asthmatic people because it actually improves their airflow. It's also good in patients that are in shock. Obviously, if you're trying to support their circulatory system, ketamine is a good choice. It is not good, however, because uh, all that increased blood flow also goes to the brain. So if you have someone with a stroke or a head injury or hypertension, do not use ketamine. That, that's the most common question you'll probably get asked about it. Head injury, stroke, hypertension, no ketamine. The other big drawback to ketamine is when patients are coming out of anesthesia from ketamine, uh, adults especially, they will get like nightmares or hallucinations and can get pretty whacked out. That's kind of where I just think of it as the PCP-like drug. Um, it, uh, it can cause problems there. So it's not used a lot in adults. We actually use it a lot in children though because they don't seem to get the same um, effects. Okay, let's talk about propofol next. It's a sedative and hypnotic. It potentiates GABA in the brain. It's a, a great drug. It is very rapid, um, mere seconds, both off and on. Uh, you know, for brief procedures, it works very good. It also does not have any analgesia to it, so you need a, a co-agent. One side effect of it, it's not a terrible one, but it can cause muscle irritability, twitching, hiccups. It does lower blood pressure and lower ICP, intracranial pressure, just a, a, a little bit, but it's pretty much replacing thiopental as the, the IV induction uh, drug of choice. Um, it actually gives patients a euphoric feeling as they're going under. They come out of uh, surgery kind of remembering that, and so it's a, it's a very positive 
um, experience. The other really nice thing about propofol uh, is that there's no like nausea or vomiting associated with it that you can get with the, the barbiturates and so propofol is, uh, is being used widely. Next we need to talk about the local anesthetics. Things that are used just for a portion of your body to lose sensation, you're still conscious. Um, you know, like lacerations or classically like an, an epidural, that's a, using a local anesthetic. Basically what they do is block nerve conduction from the periphery to your brain. So they work locally to make your brain unable to perceive pain. They abolish the sensation, but not your consciousness, obviously. And they work by blocking sodium channels. There's two main groups of them, the esters, which are procaine, tetracaine, and cocaine, and then the amides. Lidocaine, bupivacaine, mepivacaine. The way to remember it is amide has an I in it, and all the amides have two I's in their name. So uh, procaine, tetracaine, cocaine, one I, they're esters. Um, they're, they're usually infiltrated or injected into the area. Oftentimes, epinephrine is added to it. What that does is causes vasoconstriction. Uh, it slows the absorption of the drug and decreases the toxicity and decreases the dosage you need. One important thing to know about adding epinephrine is because it is a vasoconstrictor, you can't inject it into fingers, toes. The way I tell people, anything that can fall off, do not inject epinephrine. Um, another thing to know about these is if you're using them in infected uh, tissue, uh, you're going to need a lot more. Basically, the infected tissue is real acidic and uh, you're going to have to increase your dose. The, the main risk is if you get large amounts of uh, systemic uptake, you inject it straight into an artery. Um, you can cause seizures and even cardiovascular collapse. Rare, but it's not good. Um, the different agents, like I said, lidocaine is the kind of the standard bearer for them. You do need to know some of the side effects of the other agents. Bupivacaine causes cardiotoxicity. Mepivacaine you cannot use in uh, obstetrics. It's basically uh, toxic to the unborn child. Procaine will give you a lot of allergic reactions, basically just a lot of histamine release and systemically strong allergic reactions. And uh, cocaine can give you uh, arrhythmias. Um, Cocaine, uh, you know, people don't think of it as an anesthetic agent. It was actually used for quite some time. Now it's pretty much limited just to like um, mucous membranes because there's so many side effects from it. So next I'd like to talk to you about kind of what we call pre-anesthetic agents. They're the things that are used in conjunction with anesthesia to make the, the whole process uh, easier, faster, and uh, really to minimize the side effects of anesthesia a lot. Um, they can help kind of calm the patient, relieve their pain, and kind of just protect them from the side effects of the drug you're giving. So there's many of them. I'll kind of briefly talk about the different categories and what they're used for. Um, there's anticholinergics. Basically, they prevent your heart rate from going down and dry up secretions. Uh, ketamine can cause you to have uh, increased secretions. Anticholinergics, such as scopolamine, can help prevent that. Next, we have the antiemetics. Uh, nowadays, it's all ondansetron or Zofran. Um, basically, it prevents aspiration. You know, most anesthesiologists would love if everyone came in and had surgery after not having eat eaten for six hours. That's not always the case, so Zofran uh, helps during uh, induction, intubation, patients not uh, vomiting and aspirating. Um, the antihistamines basically help with allergic reaction, so diphenhydramine, um, uh, will help. We talked about some of the agents that cause allergies. Um, the barbiturates can help with sedation. We talked about thiopental, but you can actually use pentobarbital, uh, another barbiturate, which helps just kind of sedate the patient. The benzodiazepines, which we talked about, are very good at decreasing anxiety. They're good at just getting pe people peacefully uh, into the operating theater and just slowly uh, introducing them to uh, the anesthesia. They uh, also are great because they cause amnesia. So once you give the patient um, a, a benzo, they're not going to really remember what goes on from then on. Um, so the uh, muscle agents, muscle relaxants, basically uh, help with intubation uh, and decrease muscle tone for the surgeons. Um, opioids are great analgesic, so fentanyl will often be given. You know, a little Versed and fentanyl 
a uh, great combination to kind of give an amnestic effect and a good analgesia effect. One of the nice things about using pre-anesthetics also is they will lower your actual dose of the anesthetic that you need to maintain surgical anesthesia. So uh, they help out a lot. Now let's pause for a moment and review the material that was just covered. Before we do that, if you haven't already done so, this might be a good time to read your pharmacology text that corresponds to the material that was just discussed. Then together, we'll go through the quick review in the study guide. Hey there, I'm, I'm Mia from Spokane, Washington. What is the primary use of inhaled anesthetics? Maintenance of anesthesia after IV anesthetic administration. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's right, dog. But uh, I don't know if I'm digging your style. You know, you got to come with it if you want to get to Hollywood. Yeah, you just, you seem like you just. All right, Paula, get it together, please. <laughs> it's not easy being an idol, Mella. It's Mia. Does it matter? So far, I'm far from impressed. Let's try a tough one. What common side effects are associated with the use of propofol? <sighs> Muscle twitching, spontaneous movement, hiccups, and hypotension. I like it, yes. You, young lady, are going to Hollywood. <laughs> Hollywood! <laughs> All right, we're back. It's time for quick review number two. Let's get started. Describe some characteristics of thiopental. So this is one of our barbiturates. So it's high potency, high lipid solubility, rapid entry into the brain used for short surgical procedures, decreased cerebral blood flow, contraindicated with patients with asthma and porphyria. Next question. What is the mechanism of action of benzodiazepines? So benzodiazepines, they work on the GABA receptor. So uh, their primary action is that it increases the frequency of the chloride channel opening. So uh, that frequency of the channel opens more, you get more chloride into the cell and you get a, a decrease uh, action potential. Next question. What is the antidote for benzodiazepine overdose? So this is a good one to know. If someone either gets too much benzodiazepine by overdosing or perhaps you're doing a procedure and you zonk someone out a little too much, uh, well you can use flumazenil. Next question. What is an adverse effect of etomidate? So uh, you can get decrease in plasma cortisol and aldosterone levels, and this is due to inhibition of the 11 beta hydroxylase. Next question, why is ketamine contraindicated in patients with head injuries, stroke, and hypertension? So ketamine is different than a lot of our other anesthetics. A lot of the other anesthetics will decrease uh, blood flow, decrease blood pressure, overall depressing uh, the cardiovascular state. Ketamine kind of bumps this stuff up, so uh, it can increase cerebral blood flow. So if you do have a patient with a stroke or a head injury or hypertension, ketamine is not the way to go. Next question. What are the advantages and disadvantages of propofol? So advantages. Rapid onset lowers intracranial pressure, so this is different than our ketamine. Produces euphoric feeling in patients uh, and does not cause the post-anesthetic nausea and vomiting, and that's why it's so popular now. Disadvantages, poor analgesia, so you don't want to just throw someone on propofol and not forget your analgesia coverage, so you might want to add an opioid. Causes some muscle twitching and hiccups, um, not terribly common, but still happens. Next question, what can be added to local anesthetics and why? Um, so what you'll see in uh, PCP offices, you'll see uh, your regular lidocaine bottle and then you'll see another one that says lidocaine with epinephrine. So why do we put that epinephrine in there? Well, the epinephrine causes vasoconstriction and it slows the absorption of the drug uh, and it decreases toxicity and increases the duration of action. So basically I just think of it as you can't move that lidocaine out of the area. It soaks in there a little bit longer and it works pretty well. But what's very, very important, uh, when do you not want to use lidocaine with epinephrine? What body parts? 
anything uh, like fingers, the nose, toes, anything that you can interrupt the blood flow and then cause necrosis. So uh, don't use it in extremities. Next question. In infected tissue, alkaline anesthetics are charged and cannot penetrate membrane, uh, membranes effectively. How do you overcome this problem? Uh, well, like a lot of problems in the world, you just do more of it. So increase the dosage of uh, the anesthetic and you can kind of overcome that lack of penetration. Next question. How do you prevent aspiration during induction of anesthesia? Uh, well, one thing is, is try to uh, only do anesthesia on patients who haven't eaten recently. So that's number one. And number two is you can administer an anti-emetic. So if someone, if you're really worried about aspiration in someone, you can use something like Ondansetron. Uh, those medications are very, very good about decreasing nausea and vomiting. All right, so that's going to conclude our quick review number two. It's now going to be time for our end of session quiz. So I want you to stop the video. I want you to try to answer all the questions in the end of session quiz uh, and then turn on the video again and then we'll go over the answers together. All right, we're back and it's time for our end of session quiz. Let's go over these answers. Which drug class of anesthetics or individual drug is associated with the following side effect? So the first one, hepatitis. So this is one of our H's, remember? So think of the halogenated inhaled anesthetics like halothane. Our next H, malignant hyperthermia. So same thing. Remember halogenated inhaled anesthetics like halothane. Worsens porphyria. This is a good test question. Barbiturates. Increase in plasma cortisol and aldosterone levels. That's atomidate post-operative hallucinations. This one's easy because you always remember a PCP makes you trip out just like ketamine because ketamine is very similar. Next question. A 37 year old male presents to the dermatology clinic for a mole excision. He reports an allergy to procaine. Name a local anesthetic that you could use in place of procaine. So procaine has one eye. It's an ester. So what's a, a different type of anesthetic that can be used topically? Uh, that isn't in the same category, well, you can use one of the amides. So uh, you could use lidocaine, and that's probably the most commonly used one anyway. Nitrous oxide is not very soluble in the blood or in lipid solutions. What can you conclude about its speed of anesthetic induction and potency? So uh, not very soluble in blood. So it's not getting stuck in the blood so we can get into the brain tissues quicker. But not very lipid soluble, so brains like, like fat, so you're going to have a fast induction, but overall it's low potency. Next question. A 24-year-old patient presents to the emergency, emergency department with depressed mental status and depressed respiratory drive. He has pinpoint pupils. After assessing the patient's airway, breathing, and circulation, what medication would uh, be appropriate to give in this situation? So we have someone who's depressed, but a lot of medications, a lot of things can cause uh, a mental depression and a respiratory drive depression. But what's the key to this question? The pinpoint pupils. Uh, so you're seeing a lot of meiosis here. So he's probably having an opioid overdose. So if you have too much opioids on board, you're going to see that pinpoint pupil. You're going to have everything depressed down. So what can you give? Well, you want to give that opioid antagonist naloxone. Another one is called uh, naltrexone. Next question. Which anesthetic agent would be appropriate for the use in the following clinical scenarios? So first, 27-year-old woman needs a nerve block for removal of a uh, partly avulsed toenail, so lidocaine. Uh, but would you want to use lidocaine with epinephrine? No, no lidocaine with epinephrine in toes. Next one. A 53-year-old man with ischemic heart disease is about to undergo hernia repair. So. Uh, we can use one of the inhaled uh, anesthetics, ones that don't affect the heart quite so much. Isoflurane would be a good choice. 12-year-old girl has a displaced fracture uh, and the bone needs to be set. So this is more likely in an emergency department. Halothane would be fine. It's not quite so nasty tasting, so kids don't hate it so much. Next question. Which common side effect is associated with each of the following? So mepivacaine, seizures, cardiovascular collapse, toxicity to neonate. Propofol, muscle twitching, spontaneous movement, hiccups, decreased blood pressure. Thiopental, uh, laryngospasm, uh, poor analgesia. Nitrous oxide, pneumothorax. Morphine, 
hypotension, respiratory depression, muscle rigidity. Remember when you're trying to bag that patient and they have an opioid overdose, sometimes you can't bag them. Nausea, vomiting. Next question. Match the agents below with their function as an adjunct to anesthesia. More than one answer uh, choice may be correct. So we have uh, A through G here. Let's go through these. So for anticholinergics, what can we use those for? Well, they're meant to be used as uh, to prevent aspiration and then also to prevent bradycardia. So why is that uh, the prevent aspiration part? That might be a little confusing. Well, mostly it's because it's decreasing secretion. So if you don't have a bunch of secretions that you're uh, inhaling, then that's considered uh, a prevention of aspiration. Next, benzodiazepine. So why are we going to use those? Well, anxiolytic. So oftentimes when people are really ramped up for their surgery and they're really anxious, giving them maybe a lower dose of a benzodiazepine may be beneficial for them. Um, it can be used as a sedative, but it's usually not the primary sedative meant for anesthesia. Um, but it can be helpful as well. Antiemetics, um, so that's to prevent aspiration, that's an easy one. Antihistamines, so they can prevent allergic reactions. Sometimes they do have a sedative effect as well, and maybe a little bit of an anti anxiolytic effect. Opioids um, are going to be very helpful, obviously, with analgesia. It does cause a little sedation as well. Muscle relaxants, so uh, why would we want to use those? Well, that's mainly to facilitate intubation. So if you have a patient, especially in the emergency room, and they're just zonk but you're having trouble intubating them because maybe they're flailing about or that sort of thing then a muscle relaxant can be very helpful and then barbiturates what are we going to use these for mainly for their sedative effect they can really knock people out next question on which channel do inhaled halogenated anesthetics act well remember they're going to act on the chloride channels next question what medications can you use to decrease the potential for an allergic reaction to anesthesia? So we just talked about this a couple of questions ago. You can use antihistamines, decrease that histamine release. Next question. Which intravenous anesthetic is becoming a preferred medication because it is rapidly uh, acting, gives patients a euphoric feeling as they enter induction, and there is low incidence of nausea and vomiting? Uh, we asked this as on a question before as well. This is propofol. So propofol is getting to be very, very popular. So get to know that medication. You're going to run into it several times in your career uh, and all the time if you go into anesthesia. So remember propofol, really popular. It's kind of nice. Makes you feel good. Doesn't make you throw up. Um, so it's a good drug. All right, so that's going to conclude our end of session quiz. It's also going to end our uh, lecture for today. I hope you learned a little something and good luck studying.